The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. My name is Reuven Geffen, or as I'm known by my family and friends in the, in the United States, Robert Geffen. Uh, I came to Israel in 1982. Um, I lived on a kibbutz for a few years, and after I met my wife, Yaffa, we lived in different places in the South. I'm an agronomist by profession. Uh, and about uh, 18 years ago, we came here to Moshav near Moshe, where we built our home here with our children, Enat and Idan. The book that I took on to uh, have it appear in English uh, is a book that appeared in 1962. This is the original, uh, the original book from 1962. And it was written by Dove Levin and Svi Brown. Uh, about their experiences in the underground, in the ghetto of Kovna, which is in Lithuania, and later when they escaped to the forests and fought as partisans uh, against the Nazis in World War II. Uh, Dov Levin, who uh, became a professor at the Hebrew University and specialized in uh, the history of the Jews in the Baltic countries, especially in the armed resistance of Jews in the Baltic countries during World War II. Uh, he also developed a methodology of uh, studying history based on oral accounts, oral testimonies. And this book was one of the first uh, modern uses of that technique. And it's uh, about the uh, development of the Jewish underground in the Kovna ghetto. And it includes not only his own experiences, but the experiences of many others, plus academic research where uh, he was able to get to uh, as, much of the, uh, as much of the truth as is possible. So it wasn't just interviews with people and, and anecdotes, but rather uh, very uh, objective research into what exactly happened. Uh, this book uh, I originally encountered uh, when I was uh, growing up in the United States, uh, it was on the bookshelf, my father's bookshelf at home in uh, the New York area. And the reason we had it was because Dove Levine, uh, one of the two authors, Dove Levine is related to me. He's my second cousin. We have some common great-grandparents. Uh, my grandfather moved to uh, or left Kovna in 1903 uh, for the United States. And that's really the reason why I grew up safely in the United States, while Dove and his family uh, had to endure the Holocaust. Uh, Dove, uh, when he published his books, his, uh, and he published many books, uh, he would usually send a copy to my father as a gift. And so we had a few of his books in the bookcase. And this first one from 1962, uh, about the Kovna underground, uh, which was in Hebrew, of course, as a teenager, no, I looked, I opened it up, I read about one sentence and said, this is too much for me, let's do something else. But after, uh, uh, after living here in Israel for more than 30 years, my Hebrew improved a little bit. And uh, a few years ago, I started reading uh, many of Dove's books in, in English. Dove was, uh, he's getting on in years and uh, our family had kept in touch with him over the years. And then I realized that this book, this first book in 1962, I couldn't find it in English. It had never been translated. So finally I said, well, I better take this on now and I could only find it at a rare bookstore. In fact, I even found a copy that had originally been autographed by my cousin Dove. For me, it was an eye opener because even though I thought that I knew a little bit more about the Holocaust than the average person, there were many episodes in this book, many experiences, many facts 
that I had no idea about. Some of them were just uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, there's a chapter about the, uh, the incredible escape from Fort Nine where uh, Jews were imprisoned and many, many Jews were, were massacred. Uh, a number of other stories, the experiences in the ghetto, in the forest. Um, for me, it was, a, it was a reading about something that we hadn't learned too much about. And I made a resolution to myself. I said, this is something that really should go out to the world because this story, especially of the young people who, had, who were in the resistance and then later fought in the forest, this is a story that needed to be told and that I think a lot of people in the English-speaking world uh, could also relate to. Well, the difference between this book and earlier books, there were a number of books published in the 1950s. And many of those were anecdotal in the sense that uh, people were writing what they experienced, their memoirs. And this was really, I believe it is really the first academically researched book on the resistance, uh, the, the Jewish resistance to the Nazis, and perhaps even dealing with the Holocaust itself uh, that, it, that had been published. And this was in 1962, published by Yad Vashem. One of the motivations for me was that just uh, a couple of years before we started the project, um, we, my wife and I, we lost our son Idan uh, during his military service. And he was 19 years old. And uh, he, Dove had known him and had played with him as a child. And uh, seeing the pictures of the young people who were fighting in the Jewish underground and, in, and as partisans in the forest, they were all 19, 20, 21, uh, same age as our son Idan. And somehow that made a connection. And uh, I guess that's what motivated, motivated me to say that, that I wanted to see this book translated, presented to the world. And it certainly, I felt that this was part of our, uh, the way we would keep our son Idan's memory alive. And when I mentioned that to Dove, he immediately agreed and said, oh yes, absolutely, that's a wonderful idea. And then we started to get to work. I was very concerned that we be faithful to the original, that we don't make mistakes. Um, and uh, so it, it took a long time, took many months of very slow work uh, to make sure that we had uh, everything translated. And it was also very important for me that the book be readable by the English reading public. Uh, a subject like this, the Holocaust, and some of the descriptions in the book, of course, it's very heavy reading. It's not easy. And if we can at least make the book uh, approachable and readable, so we did try to make it at least where we could, uh, it's, it's in terms of visually easy to read, and also the text itself, that it would flow be easy for people to read. Uh, another big part of the process was we wanted to include uh, as many of the original photos as we could find. Uh, the, uh, the original book contained a number of photos that were very difficult to find. Uh, and of course, we had to have the originals or, or some really high quality scans uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to reproduce them accurately. So that in itself, was a, a research project because we, not all of them were in say one place, in Yad Vashem, many of them were in Yad Vashem. We had to go to some of the other Holocaust institutes uh, in Israel. Uh, or I should go back and say how he started, how he started working on it. In, uh, at the end of the war, uh, or when he, he finished his fighting, say in, uh, in the, with the liberation of Lithuania in the summer of 1944 by the Soviet Union, by the Red Army. And at that point, uh, the partisans, some of them enlisted in the Red Army and continued to fight with the Russians against the Germans. And some of them also started participating in the movement called the Bricha, which was the, uh, escape. Move, the escape, the, the movement of Jews, the survivors of the Holocaust from the different uh, countries in Europe uh, to try to get into southern Europe to the ports where they would be able to get to Palestine. Uh, Dove was uh, eventually made his way, he actually uh, made his way from Vilna all through Eastern Europe eventually uh, to Italy. Uh, a lot of his trip was on foot. <laughs> uh, he came into Israel on one of the illegal immigration ships. 
Uh, and he was at a kibbutz for a while. Uh, he enlisted in the Haganah, was, uh, and was also a student at Hebrew University in, in 1948. He was even stationed, or as a student, he was also a fighter on uh, Mount Scopus when they was isolated and under siege. Um, after uh, the War of Independence, he continued his studies. And one of the things that characterized that period was that people like him and his friend Tzvi, who had come to Israel with, uh, with nothing and with no one, as they built their own families, they also uh, met at least once a year, uh, sort of a family get-together. And during that time, they, of course, retold their experiences of what they had gone through. And at a certain point, Dove realized that this could be a very important source of information and started recording testimonies from people. He developed a methodology of how to do it, and uh, that formed the basis of their book in 1962. So while you can find in the book uh, where he does quote some of his own diaries, it's just one of many, many sources. In the ghetto underground, it was all Jews from, from the ghetto. They did try to uh, establish contact with the Lithuanian underground outside the ghetto. There is told the story of, in the book, of a visit from a Polish woman named Irena Adamowicz, who is later honored by Yad Vashem as uh, one of the Hasidei Umot Olam. And uh, she had been close with the Hashomer Hatzair organization in Poland, in Warsaw. And she was able, in 1942, to travel to Vilna, supposedly on official business for her, for her uh, job. She was a social worker. But actually, it was on a mission to establish contact with the uh, underground groups in Vilna, Abakovna's group, uh, and in uh, Kovna, and other places. Uh, to pass on information as to what was going on in Poland, uh, where they already were experiencing the genocide and knew, knew what was the plan, the Nazis' plans, and to try to encourage or, uh, the local Jewish communities in Lithuania also to organize. Because at that time, and this is one of the unbelievable things you, you, you start to understand in the book, that when the Jews in Kovna were first put into their ghetto, in the summer of 1941, they became totally cut off from the world. No newspapers, no radios, nothing. At a certain point, they were able to smuggle in clandestine radios, but they were really isolated. So at least for the first year, they had no news. They had no idea what was going on. They had no idea that even though the Nazis killed many of them in the beginning, uh, they had no idea that the plan was to annihilate all of them. And so for many of them it was, well, we just got to hold on as long as we can and get through this war somehow, without realizing that they really had no chance. Uh, so when this woman, Irena Adamovich, uh, managed to get to Kovna in 1942 and met with many of the uh, leaders of what had just been the newly formed underground, plus the ghetto leaders themselves, uh, she explained to them what was going on in Poland, the mass murders, well, the organization of the undergrounds in the ghettos. And that was a real turning point for Lithuanian Jewry because then the ghettos that she visited, Kovna, Vilna, and others, they realized that the, uh, the Germans were planning to annihilate them. They realized that rather than just talking about survival and education and keeping the culture alive and things like that, they, they had to really turn to think of, of how they were going to defend themselves. Again, the very beginning, in 1941, when the Germans, uh, the Germans attacked Lithuania or it was as part of Operation Barbarossa when they attacked the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. And uh, they conquered Lithuania very quickly, just in a matter of, uh, of days. And the first thing that happened was that uh, Lithuanian nationalist groups that had been already organizing and were uh, very much pro-Nazi, uh, and very anti-Semitic. They immediately took the opportunity those first few days when the Russian army was no longer around and the Germans had not yet established control 
to go on a rampage, a vicious rampage where they killed hundreds, even thousands of Jews, not only in Kovna, but all over Lithuania. So the first couple of weeks, it was the Lithuanian, Lithuanians themselves who were massacring Jews. Uh, at a certain point, the German army, when it came in, then took control uh, and organized the ghetto, organized, uh, forced in, in, the, uh, in the situation of Kovna, uh, of the 40,000 Jews who uh, were living in Kovna, who were a third of the population. They were a third of the population of the city, and they were told they had to all move into the small Jewish neighborhood of Slobodka. Uh, immediately during the first month or two, there were a number of uh, actionim, actions, where the Germans just came in, rounded up people, and then massacred them. So very quickly, that number was lowered. Uh, but you can imagine, well, it's actually very hard to imagine, that you're uprooted from your house, you're put into a neighborhood where you're sharing the same apartment with five other families. Uh, every day the Germans can come in and, and kill people, and they do. You're losing. There's so much trauma going on that you're barely surviving. So in the aftermath of these shocks, it took a long time until, the ver until various groups could organize and start even thinking about underground activity. At first, there was the formal organization of the ghetto that the Germans demanded. And so there were a few people, especially Elchanan Elkis, who was named uh, the leader of the, there they call it the Altenestat, which is the same as the Judenrat. And uh, they had to organize, at least organize basic services to the community, organize providing slave labor to the Germans. Um, so there was some organization already. The communists, they had been used to being underground for many years, so they recovered quickly and they started activity. They were actually the first ones thinking in terms of self-defense and were trying to uh, uh, contact their, uh, uh, their colleagues in the communist movement outside the ghetto. And that was the very important factor later on. There was a lot of contact with, with the Jewish council, with the Altenestrat. So as opposed to many ghettos where the word Judenrat has a, maybe a negative connotation here, although the Jewish council did have the responsibility of providing the slave labor to the Germans and fulfilling all their orders, they tried to be a buffer so that uh, while they would fulfill the orders, they would try to make life as, as tolerable as possible for the population. And many of the leaders in that council also were leaders in the underground, and there were very close ties between them. Uh, they began smuggling in weapons. Uh, there were a few people who were able to secretly go outside the ghetto. Uh, there was a lot of smuggling going on anyway just for foodstuffs. There were Jews uh, who were uh, used as forced labor in factories in Kovna outside the ghetto. And many of these were factories associated with war efforts, so they had access. They were able to get arms. They were able to get explosives. Again, it was very dangerous. Uh, bringing it into the ghetto under the, under the eyes of, the, of uh, the Nazis and the Lithuanian collaborators, but, uh, but they did succeed as slowly in building up a certain amount of arms. Also in the ghetto, the, the ghetto itself had a number of workshops that were set up. And it was, uh, on the one hand, it was good because then it was a place where they could have work and not have to walk 10 kilometers and then and work slave labor and then come home. But this was a place where in the ghetto they had organized workshops so they could make shoes and, and all sorts of things that they actually made for the German army. The Germans would order these things. Of course, when it came time to outfit Jewish fighters, they also did that too. Oh, one, one interesting aspect that I have to tell is that uh, sometimes I think in the Jewish communities, you know, we're always arguing about things. And there too I mentioned in Kovna that there were many different movements, many different groups. Well, all this time that they were organizing, and, and it took like a year just for the different Zionist groups to get together. And in the accounts, and this is one of the, what, what I found was interesting in, in the book, was that the accounts are that one, one uh, set of groups, they had about 40 meetings to uh, write their ideological platform. And this is their under Nazi rule, people are being slaughtered, and they're talking about their ideology. This is how important it was to people and, and how they were involved in those sorts of things. It took two years until the communists and the Zionists were willing to really work together. 
And the Zionists were saying, th were, when they were negotiating how to do it, it was obvious that the communists, since they had more experience, would, be, would probably take the command positions when it came to fighting. So the Zionists said, we don't mind being under your command, but we reserve the right to be able to sing our own songs. That was what was important to them. So that, that was something that really struck me, that in the midst of this horrendous situation, that people were still able to, wanted to cling to these, these different things. When uh, they finally, when they realized that uh, the, one of the most efficient things they could do was to get fighters to the forests, uh, they first had to, had to outfit them, they, had, they were smuggling in arms, they had to make sure they had warm clothes to survive for the winter, which again, the ghetto workshops provided many of, that, many of those things. And Chaim Yellen then had an idea where he said, well, we have to get people out in vehicles. And they actually were able to bribe Lithuanians with trucks, even a Lithuanian who worked for the Gestapo and took his Gestapo truck and uh, they would uh, usually do it uh, in the evening and they would say, uh, okay, we're uh, taking a, group, a work group out for a shift at some factory. Uh, the people were already organized. Uh, they'd get into the truck. There would be a few people dressed as German soldiers. Uh, the, the Jewish ghetto guards made sure that if there were any German guards at the gate that they were occupied, uh, they would have electrical blackouts at just at the right moment, all sorts of tricks that they, would, that they would use so that this truck could leave the ghetto, stop at a place inside Kovna where they would pick up guns that had already been, been readied. Uh, and at that point, and, and Dove recounts this when he himself left in that manner, saying at, at that point when they picked up the guns and they knew they were on their way out of Kovna, that's when the commander said, okay, load your guns, you're now partisans. And for them that was a tremendous excitement and a tremendous rejuvenation after being in the ghetto for a couple of years, being victims that now they felt that they were finally fighters. And within a day of driving, they would get to, uh, they would get to a certain point uh, driving and then uh, they'd have a couple of hours to march to reach the, uh, uh, the partisan bases in the Rudniki forests, which were not too far from Vilna. So all in all, it was about 100 kilometers from Kovna. When the fortunes of war had changed in 1943 and the Germans realized that with the Russians beginning to counterattack and advance on the Eastern Front and the United States and Britain advancing in North Africa and Italy, they realized that uh, it, their future wasn't certain and they decided that they had to erase all traces of the crimes that they had committed up to that point. And what had happened during the first couple of years of the war or, or, the, or the, the first two years after the start of Operation Barbarossa, when the Nazis attacked uh, the Soviet Union, in the wake of the advance of the German army, the Einsatzgruppen, which were mobile task force uh, with a specific mission of killing the Jews, uh, killed over about one and a half million people. So when you talk about the six million Jews killed, one and a half million were just shot by these groups and buried in mass graves in Babi Yar, in the Ninth Fort, in other places. And in 1943, uh, the uh, Nazi high command decided that in order to erase all traces, they gave orders to dig up all these graves and totally destroy all evidence, which when you think about it is, how do you do that? It's, it's something horrific. And in the fall of 1943, in the Ninth Fort, there was about 60 prisoners. Uh, almost all of them were Jewish. Some of them were Russian, P Russian Jewish POWs uh, who were being kept there. Others were different local people, local Jews who had been arrested for different crimes, one or two non-Jews. And some of the underground members, some of the members of the Kovna underground who had been arrested for different activity. And when this order came down, they called it Operation uh, 10005. They were organized uh, to dig up the graves, make huge fires, burn all the bodies, counting all the bodies so they knew exactly how many were there, taking out any gold teeth, valuables, whatever. And with the remnants of the bones that hadn't burned to grind them into powder. It was 
you can think it was just an awful, awful task that had to be done. Uh, and it's described in detail by eyewitness accounts of people, of some of the participants who survived and made it to Israel and were able to tell the story. Uh, after, or uh, very quickly after they realized that this was a terrible task that they had to, to be part of, uh, mainly prompted by the underground members, they said, uh, we're not going to stay here. We have to get out of here. And they organized, uh, methodically organized, an incredible escape. And this really could be a Hollywood film. Uh, on Christmas Eve of 1943, when most of the guards were drunk, they took advantage of that and executed their plan and were able to uh, get out of this really uh, <laughs> very uh, uh, highly defended fortress and, uh, and escape. Some of them were recaptured, some of them were killed, but uh, a number of them made it back to the ghetto where eventually they were uh, smuggled out to the forest and an account of what they had done and what they had experienced was also published. This whole story and this is incredible escape because you really read about how they how day after day they drilled holes in a steel door to be able to punch out the the door. All sorts of things like that it really is like like a movie. And the rest you can read in the book. <laughs> so today we have with us Ron Rosenbaum. You remember he was on our show a couple of weeks ago. And he wrote a book, Those Who Forgot the Past, which is, he is talking about um, basically anti-Semitism, Nazis, etc. He's a little bit worried about what's going on in this country right now, if I remember correctly. Then we have Alon Ben Meir, who's going to tell us whether Arik Sharon is in trouble or not, because he made a speech in the Knesset. And they, they did a vote on acceptance of the speech. It's never heard, it was never heard of that the Knesset would turn him down on such a vote. I mean, it's a cosmetic vote. Then he was turned down 54 to something. So there's big troubles in Israel on the uh, plan for disengagement. And then we're going to have Jonathan Trichner on, who's our pollster from Pace, who's going to tell us whether debates were won or lost by uh, Kerry or Bush or Nader, who knows what, and who's going to win the election. So it's a jam-packed show. Welcome, Ron. Good to see you again. Thank Let you. Let me show this book, Those Who Forget the Past, The Question of Anti-Semitism. So I'm reading my Jewish history books lately, and I find that a, a pretty big author named Max de Mont, he wrote the uh, Jew God in History, writes in his book that there is a huge difference between anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish. And that anti-Semitism only gave rise around the 1800s. The name anti-Semitism was invented by a guy named Wilhelm Marr, a right. German racist pseudoscientist. Right. Um, but uh, I don't think there's, it was a new name for an old phenomenon. I mean, he, he tried to give it a scientific racial basis, but of course it's a stupid basis because Arabs are Semites and all that. But it, it caught on and we're sort of stuck with it. I mean, Judeophobia is another word but that people Semites use. Semites could include non-Jews also. Totally. It's a, it's, you know, it's not, a, right, his it's, theory, it's not a great phrase. His theory is, I might have a neighbor next door to me uh, that is uh, Jewish, Polish, who knows what. I might not like that person, so I might become anti-Jewish because he does things that I don't like, but I don't want to kill him. In his uh, uh, dictionary or his association or what he thinks anti-Semitism was, <clears throat> when there was a mass of people who want to destroy, obliterate the Jewish people, totally wipe out the race. So when you're anti-Jewish, you may be against the ghetto Jews, but you don't want to kill them. You might make miserable life for them or who knows what. But when you're anti-Semitic, that means you're committed to killing the race, which is what Hitler was. Well, you know, it seems to me a distinction without a difference because you, certainly Hitler was anti-Jewish as well as anti-Semitic. Anti right. So, like, why quibble about mm -hmm. names? It seems to me like not, we're not, it doesn't get us further. We don't learn a lot more from making that distinction. But it is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it, you know, it's, it's true that anti-Semitism is not 
the best word for it. Uh, um, Jew hatred is probably the best word for it. Um, but I don't necessarily buy this thing about you want to kill only one Jew, it's anti-Jewish. You want to kill them all, it's anti-Semitic. I mean, it just doesn't what, seem to What do you believe the roots of anti-Semitism are? Jealousy? I, you know, there's a great essay in this book, which is a collection of 50 essays. It's by right. Cynthia Ozick, one of the great right. American writers. Right. And she, trace, she traces it. I mean, most people would say it started when Christianity defined itself against Judaism as opposed to being a descendant of Judaism. And uh, we're the anti-Judaizers in the uh, Paul among them in, in but you, you know, you, by but the way, it goes back to be a, to the classical okay, times. But, but you know why that happened? That's interesting. Christianity came very easy to apply to, in a sense. When Paul wrote the book, and and, and they got he Jesus. dropped circumcision. Of course, he made it, it much it, much it, more it, user it, friendly. It, it became, that's right. It yeah. became very user friendly. So yeah. to catch people to be a Jew was much more complicated. You had to be. A, in a sense, a, month, a monotheist who believed that the Messiah will come and the development of these messiahs, whereas you want to become a Catholic, it was Christian and easy. Just had to say a few words. And, and in the early church, there was a kind of struggle, theological struggle, and those who believed in saying that the Jews had rejected Jesus and would be condemned for it and were a stubborn people and were an outcast people, right. We should allow them to live, but they should never be happy because there'd be a living example of, uh, of the consequences of rejecting Jesus. And that faction won. And, uh, but, but wasn't there a hatred against the Jews who wouldn't convert? They wanted yes, people I to mean, convert. I That's I, where it really began. I, I, I think so, but I think it's also uh, that the Jews threatened the new Christian theology because they, you know, Christianity defined itself sort of as uh, a completion of Jewish scripture. Um, and the Jews were there to, uh, to say, not according to us. And, uh, and so that, yeah, that, there was a hatred. And I think it, 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 you know, it's theologically based. And then over the years, it just became a very useful device whenever there was a trouble, uh, a right. trauma in a troubled society, of course. Too. Right. The Russian anti-Semitism uh, at the time of the Tsars, and uh, there was no reasoning for it. It was just anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. I mean, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. It was brutal, and we're still suffering from it. Like, the, it was the Russian secret police that invented the protocols of the elders of Zion, the original theory about the I'm world Jewish conspiracy. I'm not sure people know about that. It was a huge book that was created in Russia saying that they were, the Jews were conspiring really through through businesses and through other ways of uh, taking over all the systems that make the world happen and they they really should be obliterated. Right, it was that the Jews were pulling the strings to uh, manipulate the right. Gentiles for power. How big did that book become? The book unfortunately uh, was translated into many languages. It was tra uh, Henry Ford here in America yeah. produced his own version of it. Hitler uh, was introduced to it by Alfred Rosenberg, um, and uh, it became an extremely big influence on Hitler, um, and who cribbed from it from Mein Kampf. Uh, and we see it today. You see it on the internet, okay. sort of, you know, uh, modern versions of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and the idea that the Mossad was behind 9/11. Um, uh, all yeah. this garbage, you know, right. comes to, comes from that sort of template. Are people interested in, in, in books like yours today? I think that uh, Jews want to know the source of this unique kind of hatred, and they want to know what the prospects for the future are. Um, what, and what, do you, what do you see in your book as the prospects for the future? I, I have to admit, I, I think of myself as a pessimist. I mean, I, and, and, are you worried and, about assimilation? I'm not as worried about assimilation as I am worried about a nuclear exchange between Iran and the state of Israel sometime in the next 10 years. All right, that's a big topic. I, I went into that talk very sure. thoroughly in Israel, especially with Yuval Steinitz, <coughs> who was chairman of the uh, Defense and Foreign Affairs Committee, and I did it with Donny Otom. And I can tell you, we can check with Alon Ben Meir, but I can tell you that it's number one on the agenda of Israel. 
uh, the crisis in Israel is to hold back and not think that they can replicate what they did in Iraq in 81, which Menachem Begin successfully did, because Iran is a totally different ball of fish, right. and they've got to be very cautious. So the government line is, look, those rockets or those uh, nuclear whatever they are facilities can endanger Europe. Europe should be very nervous and the United States should be very nervous and they should take care of it. Israel should really stay out of it. That's the official line. But Sub Rosa, my feeling is that they, they probably have a plan there to do something, but they have to hold back because there are a lot of different problems that would uh, come about if that did happen. I, th I think it's a, you know, just very troubling because... Uh, well, they have government anti-Semitism because the Iran the in government, I'm not sure about the people because there's a great mix there, as a policy, want to wipe out the Jewish state. Hashemi Rasfanjani, famous Iranian yeah, mullah, did right. some arithmetic uh, a couple years ago. And he said, well, we know uh, that if we attack the state of Israel in a nuclear exchange with our rockets and the bomb that we will soon have, we might lose 15 million people when they retaliate. But on the other hand, there are a billion Muslims in the world and we will succeed in wiping out the five million Jews of Israel. And that's, a, a, you know... Yeah, and you know why that works? Unfortunately, the theory, because if you send nuclear bomb, let's say Israel takes its nuclear and, and bombs them, there'll be radioactivity which will kill 15 billion, but they don't care. Yeah, that's right. Whereas mm -hmm. Israel could be obliterated, could that's be wiped right. out. The, uh, the, the numbers are... So they're are willing to sacrifice. It's absolutely true. Yeah. And there was a book written years ago, a model called the Masada Plan or something like that, where there was a standoff at that time maybe between Egypt and uh, Jordan because there was no uh, uh, peace treaty. But the, the rule was, okay, if you bomb me, I bomb you, we radioactive the whole place, so no one's going to do anything. It was a standoff. But you're absolutely correct in what you say about they don't care. You're right. That's and, a, that's a uh, treacherous position. And, and you know what I think is troubling you're is so right that, that. that uh, uh, the demonization of Israel by the world's media has made this easier to happen because it's oh, sort of yeah. delegitimized the Jewish state. Um, you know, they use Nazi metaphors for uh, when the Jews try to defend You're themselves. You're absolutely right. There's a creeping anti-Semitism in Europe that, uh, and there is a, uh, also a, a system in place now to try and put Israel in a racist situation. They compare it now to South Africa before the, uh, you know, it got its, so to speak, independence. So they're trying to box Israel into a place where it's, uh, it's a racist country against the Palestinians. And the, uh, you know, the double standard is really astonishing. I mean, just here in America even, you know, you will hear on, in the political discourse, in the debates, uh, someone will say, well, Iraq was not a source of terrorism. Well, I'm sorry, Iraq was financing parties for suicide bombers and giving bonuses of $25,000 uh, right. to the families of people who blew up Israeli Absolutely. children. And uh, so don't tell me Iraq was not a source of terrorism. What you're saying, and if, uh, the people who say that is, uh, Jews don't count. You know, you can kill, uh, if you kill Americans, you know, that's terrorism. But killing a bunch of Jews, um, that's not somehow something to be taken into account. All right, two questions. Number one, how did you get so involved in this? And two, I want to talk about the current candidates and wh what you think would be better in terms of uh, Jews, not only Israel, but as an American Jew. Okay. Number one, briefly, um, I spent 10 years writing a book called Explaining Hitler, The Search for the Origins of His Evil, and it was about a critique of the theories of the origins of Hitler's anti-Semitism, its particular virulence, I, you know, and I, so I spend a lot of time studying that subject. It was published by Random House in 1998, translated in 10 languages, great reviews, et cetera, et cetera, but I thought this was something that was safely in the past. I thought this, uh, you know, it was 1998. Did that book sell well? Yeah, it yeah. was a, a bestseller. And there was a, a peace process going on. Um, it was only after 2001 that I suddenly realized we are seeing a form of Hitlerism again. Um, and that's and, why you wrote this? Oh, yeah, I mean, I compiled it. There, there, it's yeah. a, a, long, a, a long introduction by me, but there are like 
uh, 50 brilliant writers and thinkers talking about various aspects of this subject. Um, so, you know, I, after 2001, I, uh, I felt well, that... But what made you interested in Hitler? <sighs> you know, it's interesting. I grew up uh, in a very assimilated, a suburban really? uh, community on Long Island, Bayshore. Um, really? And didn't know any Holocaust survivors. The figure six million was an abstraction to Your me. Parents were American born. Parents were American born, most third, fourth generation. Interesting. Um, but uh, I, shortly before my father had a stroke, and uh, he told me that he had a second cousin who, uh, from the French branch of his Hungarian family, who, who died in the Holocaust. And looking back on it now, mm. I think that made a difference to me because it. It shouldn't have made a difference. I mean, but it, it made me feel that all of Hitler's victims were part of my extended family in some really? way, and uh, made me. I, I was an investigative reporter, and I wanted to. Where did, where did you go to college? I was at Yale. Um, did you study anything about Judaism in Yale? Almost nothing. I was uh, uh, an English major. Really. Uh, um, the symbol of uh, Yale is in Hebrew, by the way. I know, and uh, I could barely read it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so I, uh, anyway, I, uh, I, 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 you know, I suppose I came to this late, but, uh, you know, um, I, I, right. I think it's so, everyone's I mean, I duty. It, it's burning in you. I mean, I mean it's, it's a passion a, right now. It, it really is. I mean, All right, let's talk about Bush and Kerry. Where do you come out on that? Bush was my classmate at Yale. Um, is that right? Yeah. Um, Tell me about it. I, I didn't know him. I knew some friends of his who were preppies, you know. Uh, He's so, a real frat guy, huh? Uh, at, at Yale, frat guy says one thing, preppy says another thing. Okay, preppies, tell me the difference. I'm preppies interested. were the guys who went to St. Paul's and Andover right, and Choate school. and pla places like this, right. expensive private schools, Correct. and basically ran Yale when I got there. There was still, I think it was the last year of the Jewish quota when I got to Yale. Really? Um, and, um, I didn't experience anti-Semitism there, but anyway, preppies did rule the place, and George Bush was a typical preppy. He was a frat boy also. Some of the preppies were like classier in a way. Uh, Bush was a member of Deke, which was Tell not- Tell me, Ron, yeah. everybody talks about the brilliance and non-brilliance of, uh, of uh, George Bush. Did he have to have grades to get in, or he had pedigree to get into Yale? I think he got in mostly as a legacy candidate, but I don't think he's necessarily stupid. I think he's ignorant and ill-informed and, and, uh, and, and a lazy, you know, I mean, but on the other hand, okay, now that I've put him down, let me talk about the other side of okay. it. I was out in Ohio yeah, I recently. I want to hear it. I was out in Ohio recently, the big swing state, and I was, I had speaking at temples in uh, Columbus and Cincinnati. Um, and so I was talking with a lot of Jews about this subject. And one of them said something that stayed with me, you know, one of them said, Bush gets it uh, about Israel, and uh, to a certain extent, I agree with that. Uh, you know, Israel's wall to wall for Bush, by the way. Yeah, wall Bush, to wall. Bush gets that terrorism is indivisible; uh, it's something to be opposed, and he admires the Israeli struggle against it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And and I tend to agree that in, you know, in in b larger terms, Bush does get it. I mean, he's, he has this... You talk in terms of Judaism and Israel. And, and, and Israel and Israel's right to, to fight for their survival, no, for no, their no, self-defense. What self he defense. did, well, I've said this a hundred times, I'll repeat it because we're coming near the election. What he did by taking off the table the right of return for Palestinian refugees to Israel is to me tantamount to a Balfour Declaration that it's, takes that right off the table. Uh. He, you know, he really revised it radically. Um, on the other hand, I feel that um, he, he had a great idea for fighting terror that was good for the Jews as well, which is that you, you fight terror by promoting democracy in the Middle East, which is the source of uh, the breeding ground of which terror. Which is not very easy. And, right, and the Iraq war was his showcase for that. And it was a great idea, and it looked like it was working, but he, I, I feel his inattentiveness. I blame him for you know, not correcting the course and, and making this work, because he's delegitimized that idea, uh, I think, to a certain extent, 
by uh, his failure to execute. Um, All right, so tell me about your fellow alumnus in John, John Kerry. John Kerry. He was a couple years earlier than me. I used to check out books for him in my scholarship job at the really? uh, Yale Reserve book. And he was already like, styled itself JFK and yeah. you know and he was a rising there was a piece by the way on Frontline Channel 13 the other day which compared them yeah uh, I don't know if you saw it I didn't mm. they, they were pretty negative to Bush and a little more positive to Kerry uh, at least because of the war and the Vietnam and all that business but tell me about Kerry about his uh, relationship to Israel to Jews etc you know his brother's a Jew uh, his grandparents were Jewish. Who knows? Very, very hard to tell. You know, um, you can't get a feeling out uh, of it. Uh, you know, because did he really only just recently discover that his grandparents were Jewish? You know, he pretended to be Irish for uh, a Maybe long time. Maybe they were dancing with Madeleine Albright's yeah, uh, parents. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, you, you just wonder. How, you, you know, the lack of curiosity or whether this discovery, you know, actually was, you know. And the brother, and, and when I was in Ohio, the pro carry Jews would say, well, his brother's Jewish. That means nothing to me, you know, because there are a lot of uh, Jews with whom I disagree, you know, and the fact that his brother's Jewish doesn't matter. All right, matter. at the end of the day, if you had to make a call, can you make it? Or? I find myself really conflicted about it. I, I find myself, like, uh, really antagonized by... Uh, a lot of the Kerry supporters, and don't th I don't think that Kerry has a party or a base that w is willing to support. If we're just talking about this issue of Israel and the Jews, that that is willing to support his uh, that kind of leadership, the way Bush has been able to take his party behind his policy. However, I just feel I do feel that Bush has, you know, in some way delegitimized a good policy by uh, failure of execution. So was the, uh, was the war in Iraq a positive move or a negative move? I think it was a just cause. Um, I believe in, All you right, know. So to wrap it up for you, you yeah. think that you have to be affirmatively against terrorism. You can't wait till, Kerry made sort of a, a silly statement in the New York Times. I wasn't in the country, but uh, he said that terrorism is a nuisance. Well, he said he wants to, ret you know, he. He's made it, that's the thing. He, both he and Edwards have made sort of a mixed series of, you know, they both have said we want to hunt down and kill Al-Qaeda and all terrorists. Well, that's fine. And then this, the nuisance statement was a little bit misinterpreted. I mean, what he said was, you know, we'd like to, I think what he meant to say was, we'd like to hunt down and kill enough of these terrorists so that uh, we see. could go back to the way we were before 2001. All right. that, that's, that's not a bad statement. It's a, yeah. How about a statement, uh, and this, we're running out of time, about uh, Cheney's daughter being a lesbian. Do you think that was out of place? It struck me as odd both times. <laughs> they, I mean, Edwards brought it up, too. I, and it, it's hard for me to believe that they could be that cruelly Machiavellian as to, like, you know, want to send a signal to homophobes um, uh, or something like that. Uh, you know, I, so I can't really make up my mind about that. All right. We're out of time. We've got to bring okay. you back right after the election. You'll do analysis for it. Happy he to. writes for the New York Observer. That's the pink sheet. I don't mean pink in terms of being a pink place, but I usually meant communist. But uh, they are uh, colorful, and it's uh, the New York Observer.